three, two, one. Let's do this. Chryso friends, welcome back to Opus L and I, where we finish our projects in a timely manner. Kind of. Sort of. Well, sometimes anyway. Last video, as you may remember, I practiced a little project necromancy and revived my manuscript challenge project, wherein I recreate this illumination from the Romance of Alexander, a manuscript from the 1340s. And as a quick aside, last video I mistakenly stated that the manuscript challenge started in 2004, which is incorrect. It actually started in 2014, which I had written correctly in my notes, but somehow didn't say. For this dress, I'm looking at another coat hardy type garment, but with a couple of different details. The two biggest changes I'm making are the closure and the sleeves. The manuscript image shows an overdress with no visible closure method. And I could conceivably make this another front lacing dress, but I rather enjoy that very smooth front. So I'll be changing that up. And then the sleeves will also need to be altered to include the pendant portion. I thought about making this a short sleeve coat hardy with detachable tippets, which are the white bands and streamers that fall from the elbow like this. But looking through the rest of the manuscript, it really does seem as though the sleeves are cut as one piece. So. Everyone go grab your cuppa. Today I am drinking Old Toby by Tabletop Teas. Of course. It's a black tea with smoke and bourbon and tobacco notes that make it, oh, it just tastes like a, a winter morning in a cabin with a fire. And it's just, it's so good. Let's get into it. I'll start off by ironing and starching my linen fabric. At least I didn't have to contend with electronic shenanigans this time, so I was able to get this step done without any trouble. And I'm back to being a floor gremlin for this project. I just realized that this dress is going to match my chair. I seem to have quietly fallen in love with emerald green. I suppose it won't be the first time I've made furniture camouflage. I am cutting the front of the dress on the fold in order to create that flat front that is evident in the manuscript. I am also cutting it as if the button placket edge rather than the front seam is the center. This will ensure that the dress is roomy enough to wear over the lavender coat hardy. Because I'm cutting the pattern piece out on the fold, I'll have to piece the skirt corners from scrap fabric, which is fine, piecing is period. Next, I'll flip the front piece over and mark along all of the sewing lines on the other half. It's kind of a pain to have to go back in and trace this a second time, but with a pattern piece this big, it's easier to align things to a centerfold than try to trace the piece mirrored on a single layer of fabric. The two back pieces and sleeves will be traced individually since they'll have to be sort of tetris in and around each other, and the additional corners for the front.
After they're all traced, I can cut them out. Every time I edit this part, I feel like I should be doing ASMR videos. We've reached the existential crisis part of the project. It's important at this point to have some floor time and really vibe with the cognitive dissonance of trying to be a creative person in late stage capitalism while you're stretching your back out because you're not actually a young creative person anymore. Once I'm over myself, I'll move to my cutting table to work on drafting the sleeves. I'm starting off with a short sleeve pattern I used in my gray coat hardy, which has the seam running down the back of the arm. In order to accommodate the pendant sleeve, I'll need to shift that seam so it runs down the inside of the arm, like modern sleeve patterns. To do that, I'll trace the pattern onto new paper, tape it into a cylinder, and cut a new seam where I want it. Then I can retrace that and add the pendant section. In order to figure out how wide the hanging pendant section should be, I'll tape the sleeve pattern back together and mark it while it's on my arm. After a quick try on to make sure I have the length I want, I am ready to start cutting the remaining pieces starting with the front corner pieces and then the sleeves and the lining, which I'm going to use some leftover white linen for that. I'm tracing the lining one side at a time since the pieces are smaller and manageable on my cutting table.
I was worried that the pendant sleeve pattern would be wasteful since it's such an odd shape, but it can be tessellated into a nice compact rectangle. Here's where things get fun. The manuscript image is painted such that the inside of the pendant sleeves is pretty obviously fur. Garments in the late Middle Ages were often completely lined with fur because the Little Ice Age meant that the average temperature was significantly lower than what we experience today. And not to mention that Texas is a lot further south than England. Instead of using fur, real or faux, I'm going to paint the insides of the pendant sleeve lining with a pattern called ver, which was used to signify fur, specifically squirrel pelts and heraldry. Okay, in order to do the ver sleeves, I am going to need paint, and I actually don't have the kind of paint that I need. So it's time for us to go get some. Let's go to my supplier. Bebe? Yeah? Can I have some paint? Uh, yeah, for sure, what colors? I need gray and... Um, Ooh, you want silver? The fancy oh, silver? Yes, silver. And can I also have some fabric medium so that my paint doesn't get all weird and stiff? Yes. Thank you. I'm mixing up roughly equal parts of paint and fabric medium as I did in the Pokemon Hood project. I want the color to be mostly gray with a hint of silver in the light, but it seems that someone decided I didn't have enough silver in it and fixed that when I went to go fetch some water. I didn't even realize it until I was editing. Painting these sleeves was the most time-consuming part of this project, but I'm super happy with the way they came out. The variegated gray and silver of the paint evokes natural fur variation, and the gray and white patterning looks so delightfully medieval. After the prep is all done, I can start sewing. The first thing I need to do is sew the corners onto the front piece and then I can treat that all as one. As long as your piecing seams match the grain of the fabric and aren't on the bias, they should drape as if they were one piece, which is really convenient.
Next, I'll sew the back seam and then the front and back pieces together at the shoulders and the left side. I'll leave the right side torso portion open since that's where I'll be putting the closure, but I'll sew the skirt seam. Once that's done, I can repeat the whole thing with the lining pieces, but you'll have to take that on faith since apparently I didn't get any footage of that. Time to sew the sleeves up. I have to be careful when pinning and sewing, nothing is more frustrating than ending up with two left sleeves. Once each sleeve and lining is sewn, I can start to assemble them. The sleeves will be pinned with right sides together and then I can sew around the bottom edge and pendant portion. Quick break to show off Tornado's latest embroidery projects. I really love seeing them dive into new crafts and persevere despite not attaining instant perfection. After I trim down the seam allowances, I'll clip all of the curves and corners. Since the pendant curve when turned right side out will be concave, I'm clipping small notches out of the seam allowance to make sure the sections don't overlap each other. Next, I'll turn the sleeves right side out and tuck the lining inside. Then a good pressing to make everything nice and neat and I can turn to assembling all of the parts. I'm pinning and then sewing the dress to the lining at the collar, right sides together, and then clipping the seam allowances again before turning everything right side out and pressing.
With necklines like this, the corners are the weakest point since the cloth rotates to a much more obtuse angle than it is cut, and that corner has to be clipped to lie flat when turned right side out. I like to reinforce them with a small bit of buttonhole stitch just a quarter inch or so along each side of the corner. I'm using a matching buttonhole silk for maximum strength and durability. Time to address the side opening. I'm ironing the seam allowances of the lining and side opening towards the inside of the dress and then I will hand stitch those two layers together. I could have wrestled to turn everything inside out and machine stitch it, but I'm trying not to spend my entire life sitting in my studio, so I opted for the flexibility of hand sewing. And when I'm done with that, I'll also tack down the lining hem to the inside of the dress. To insert the sleeves, I'm pinning both layers to the fashion layer of the dress. I'll sew along the marked line and then trim down the seam allowance. Then I can fold the lining seam allowance in, clipping if necessary, and hand fell that into place. I'm also going to make sure to reinforce the top and bottom of the lacing seam, just in case of strain.
Thank you to all of my current and continuing Kofi members. Your support and the support of all of my members and croissants makes it easier to do what I do and to provide quality content for everyone. I can't express how much you all mean to me. Stick around after this brief commercial break to see me finish up the dress. I thought about all of the ways I could lace this dress up. I could do eyelets like the underdress, or I could sew twill tape down and lace through that, or I could do lacing rings. And since I happen to have lacing rings from Bad Baroness, the same place I get almost all my buttons, I figured I'd try them out. I'll finish out the lacing by securing a piece of quarter inch twill tape to the top of one side of the opening, and I also added a permanent aglet to the end of the lace. Since the lacing rings are 12 millimeters, it will fit through them fairly easily. And once I can lace the dress closed, I can mark the hem. I'm using the same tool as I did the last time, but I'm squeezing the bulb with my foot instead. The tube is just not long enough to mark a floor length dress otherwise. The chalk did show up very nicely on the dark fabric as I guessed it would. After I mark the actual hemline of the dress, I'll cut off the extra length and sew the hem with a felling stitch, which I definitely didn't do during a work meeting.
Thank you for joining me today. I can't tell you how much of a relief and an accomplishment it's been to finish a project that's been literal years in the making. I'm really excited to wear this to my next SCA event that is at 900 degrees out. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, click the bell for notifications if that's your jam, and consider sharing this or any of my videos to social media. If you're interested in finding me, I am at Opus LNI everywhere, and those links, as well as the link to my coffee, will be in the description box below. Until next time, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Woo!